The role of next generation sequencing on the management of uh, chronic myeloleukemia still is not very clear. We understand that there is a recent um, evidence and uh, publication that really are been investigating the uh, possible mutation that may happen in patients that later on can transform. However, it still is not really a clear uh, utility of this technique in the regular management of uh, CML. I would like to make the point, however, is that in order to address the able mutation that are sometimes being seen on their treatment with tyrosine kinase inhibitor, it's important to remember that next generation sequencing is only going to really address mutation in most of the time normal able and not in the BCR able. So it's important to really specifically order kinase domain mutation that has been done or need to be uh, performed after amplification of BCR able. That will be an important uh, point to consider when uh, people in the community and in other institutions can have access to these panels of next generation sequencing that include able. In order to choose uh, front generation or second generation TKI in our patients with uh, newly diagnosed chronic myeloleukemia, we always have to consider several factors including age and risk of uh, disease at diagnosis. In terms of when I use uh, frontline generation TKI, I really keep these options in this case uh, for patients who really have multiple comorbidity. Most of the time they are all age and you know they are low risk disease and the reason is because you don't really uh, the importance of early molecular response of the uh, control and the, the, in the long run is not as important in another uh, group age. So the use of second generation TKI in the treatment of chronic myeloleukemia is a topic that has been uh, in, in, the, in the area of CML for the last, uh, for many years, right? And there is no doubt that the second generation TKI, in this case the satinib, nilotinib, has an important role in uh, multiple areas in this setting. Uh, in my uh, case or in my practice, I really most of the time use this second generation TKI, dasatinib and nilotinib. And in general, I use this in younger population of patients, right? Who for sure, in specifically in people who has high or intermediate risk. However, we can also can offer these uh, drugs in people who has low risk disease, with the goal to achieve this complete molecular response that will be open the possibility to discontinuation of the drug after a number of years, most of the time for two, three, four years, and of course, after at least two years of complete molecular response. In terms of when I use the satinib or nilotinib, it's really, really a matter of uh, performance status and comorbid conditions. It is true that the satinib and nilotinib has a different pathology, and of course, the satinib sometimes is more adapted to younger population who are active lives, and may really be a little harder for them to really have twice a day um, with fasting requirements. However, there's another population that may be uh, in between, or they are not too old, who are not really bothered by this pathology, and they really, really may be a very good candidate for this drug. Uh, beside this, this uh, uh, pathology administration, of course, comorbid condition are really an important part of choosing these two second generation TKI. And we always discuss that in patients who has pulmonary conditions or chronic obstructive uh, disease, uh, well, we try to avoid as much as we can the satinib, while in patients who has a severe history of diabetes or very strong cardiovascular uh, history, we may really uh, shy away of nilotinib due to the described side effects. On the topic of personalized uh, dosing of uh, different TKI, I have to really say that um, we used to really have access to imatinib levels in a few years ago. Unfortunately, we don't really have this anymore. There is some evidence from the Australian and also from the French group that optimizing the dose of imatinib in the first to second months from 400 to 600 or even higher dose, depending on the level, may really improve outcomes. And of course, it's something that uh, was a study. 
However, these days uh, we don't have an easy access to dosing or levels, and this really makes it extremely difficult to really perform this personalized dosing. The truth is that, in general, in the history of CML, we have seen that most of the drugs that we are being using as a frontline, uh, or at least they are being studied initially, uh, with uh, subsequent studies has been shown that the dose was too high, and these examples with uh, the satin of 140, now we are using 100 milligrams, and even the data, the lower dose can really be efficacious. The same thing with nilotinib, 400 milligrams twice a day was explored initially, they were lower to 300 milligrams twice a day, and we now, the lower dose also can be efficacious later on. However, unfortunately, we still don't have a really good information about how to measure levels and how to really uh, specifically personalize these, these therapies.